Hi, friends. Welcome back. I'm Stacey Bellward, the host of the Connected Families podcast. Welcome to our community. We are people committed to pursuing God's grace and truth for ourselves and then daily working to pass that grace and truth on to our children. I'm so glad that you are here today. Well, I'm really looking forward to today's podcast. Jim and Lynn Jackson, co-founders of Connected Families, are with me. And we will be talking about the second layer of the Connected Families framework where parents are connecting with their kids and parents want to communicate the message, you are loved no matter what. In this layer of the framework, parents are thinking in terms of the work of Jesus on the cross and how he loved us first. And therefore, we want to love our children in all situations and in the way that they understand and are able to experience that love. This is the layer that we often say, enjoy your kids, give affection and empathize. Today, we want to do a deeper dive with our founders to dig down into the heart level of you are loved no matter what. This is a great time to do a deep dive because the episode kicks off a month where we will be talking about discipline that connects the online course, which is the same title of Jim and Lynn's book. Before I get started, are you a regular listener? Have you tapped through and followed the show? And would you share the podcast with a friend in a similar parenting stage as yourself? Now is a really good time to do that. Okay, let's get started. Hi, Jim and Lynn. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Stacey. Hey, Stacey. Yeah, it's good to be with you again this way. I am looking forward to today because we're just wanting to have the two of you onto the podcast to invite a deeper conversation about one of the layers of the framework. I mentioned it in the intro, love, no matter what, you are loved no matter what. That's the message that we want to communicate. And so we're we're going to dive deep. Are you ready? I'm ready. We're ready. We've been having a spirited discussion about the topic here for the last little while, so we're ready to roll. We are ready to roll. I think that this topic almost brings tears to my eyes before we even start, because I just feel like this phrase, love in the midst of misbehavior, really is one of the phrases that sets connected families apart from so many other, maybe other organizations, you know, what people teach. And it's very poignant because as a parent, I think back to when I felt really stuck. I was a pretty young parent then. And I think many parents feel really stuck because it's that moment when you're having a struggle with your child and the parent has a whole wide range of emotions and it could be intense anger It could be disappointment. It could be just, I don't know what to do with this. I just don't know. So they might even feel frozen. And yet this phrase, love in the midst of misbehavior, is what we talk about so much here at Connected Families. I want to start by backing up a little bit to what you said, that it's deeply sad to me that every Christian parenting ministry doesn't start with this idea. We're told that God loved us so much. God demonstrated his love. God loved us so much. How does the verse go? Romans 5, 8. Mm -hmm. And God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And so here's this intersection of absolute profound sacrificial love right on top of the very misbehavior, sin, uh, awfulness of the human condition that kept people separated from God. And it's the leading act for the reconciliation, the restoration of his people to himself. And we miss it when we're parenting because of that frustration that you talk about, because of that depth of urgency, because of the fact that we just read the latest method and it said it should work and it's not working or whatever the case may be. And so Yeah, I mean, our history with this is long because, you know, when we were first starting out as young parents, like you, we we were longing for something deeper than what we were getting in the conventional teaching. And we started to look into the scriptures and look into our own experience. And I was working with high-risk kids at the time. And, you know, there, the leading message of our outreach was, we're going to be a place where you know that you're loved no matter what, no matter what. And the kids who came to us were misbehaving children. (laughs) teenagers in all kinds of ways and their misbehavior got them into trouble of all kinds. And we knew that the the heart of the gospel was going to be communicated to them. If we could meet this need, 
that we believe all of them had to know that they're loved no matter what. And at the same time, we were parenting three really intense, active, sensitive kiddos. And a really impactful moment one day was when we asked them, kids, what do we do that best helps Mm. you know that you're loved? And one of them said, snuggles. And another one said, she actually said sesame chicken, which meant special dates (laughs) for her favorite (laughs) meal. (laughs) But the third one said, mercy when I blow it. And I know he wasn't asking to be let off the hook, but he was asking to feel really cared about when he struggled and he misbehaved and he knew he had screwed up. And that just like was so impactful. Yeah. Yeah. That became a caricature for us. We felt like God gave us a gift of our son speaking to us on behalf of many children the children that I served in the ministry to high risk teens but you know then we started paying attention to the to the different discipline practices that were being taught at the time and that parents were implementing in in the context of church or out in public whatever it was and so much of what we saw was was a shameful rendering of discipline it was meant to make kids feel bad and their bad feeling was often less about the behavior they'd done and more about the broken nature of relationship between them and their parents and we saw this driving wedges in relationship between kids and their moms and their dads and we just wanted to discover and find a better way and we didn't want to just make it up like as a pop psychology thing so we really wrestled with what is the, what are the scriptures say about this. And you look at the model of Jesus. When Jesus disciplined his children, who were the disciples, you don't see any any punitive effort on his part. He was always kind. He was always thoughtful. He was always reflective. And he was always inviting the disciples to something deeper, something better. When Peter got out of the boat and and then didn't have the faith and or cut off a soldier's ear. What I think of is when he denied Christ three times and his repentant, yeah. his tears of repentance flowed when Jesus looked at him. Now, you know, based on if Jesus is then going to pray for the forgiveness of the, his murderers while he's hanging on the cross, you know that that l- glance or that gaze was so full of compassion for Peter mm-hmm. that it just broke his heart. So, you know, we we started paying attention to the scriptures. We found lots of examples of, you know, Romans 2, 4 invites us to think about the kindness of God, which leads to repentance. And this isn't precisely a parenting directive, imperative, but certainly it's in the in the rendering of the nature of God and, and teaching truth about how this all works. Kindness, God's kindness leading to repentance. What does that look like in human relationship? Could we emulate that in some certain sort of ways? And so, again, with our own kids and with other people's kids, we started just, A, praying to have that heart of love. Like, Jesus is the author of this. It's not our clever tricks. Jesus is the author of love. And if we can bring his love into the context of misbehaving children, dare I say sinning children, then maybe, just maybe, that gives those kids the most open door in their soul to be receptive to the Holy Spirit's conviction and then to repent from their sin. And so in the youth outreach where I worked, you know, we just made a practice, like we talked about it out loud as a team, let's pray to love these kids no matter what, and then let's pray for opportunities to demonstrate love no matter what. Well, it's easy for kids to think they're lovable when they're doing what they ought to do. It's hard for kids to believe that they're loved no matter what when they're doing what they ought not do. And we found that to be the best opportunity to then find ways to communicate love to them. Now, that didn't mean letting them off the hook for their behavior. It didn't mean not addressing the things they'd done that they ought not do. It meant bringing a different heart to the act of engaging with what we observe to be their misbehavior or their sin. So Jim, you were doing that at your work with at-risk kids, but I know I can have a lot more patience with other people's kids and in public settings than at home. (laughs) When you mentioned your three. And so how did you bring that home? Yes, it started by just praying for a changed heart. And recognize over and over again, over and over again, (laughs) praying for that. Right. Because let me just pause you there a second, Lynn. What was the heart that you had? What, what needed to change? The quick judgments that this is not okay. And kind of, even though we didn't use these shaming words in our mind would be what is wrong with you that you're doing this again. 
Hmm. You know, I in our book, I talk about the shift in how I approach sibling conflict with just like, oh, he's at it again, you know, and just bringing in my baggage from my older brothers, how older brothers treat younger sisters, and then roaring down the stairs with that baggage and that anger, yeah. and then shifting to, I want for my children the kind of relationships in life that Jesus bought for them on the cross. And that shift yeah. was part of that transition. And then I entered with compassion for these two little kiddos that were struggling. And it was just, it was a, a 180 in how I responded to that because I saw that precious opportunity in misbehavior mm -hmm. to communicate unconditional love and represent the unconditional love of the father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stacy, early on, I remember, you know, we're wrestling with this. We're trying to figure it out because so much of the conventional teaching uh, was compelling. It was done by sophisticated people who we looked up to. And, you know, I heard one of them one day to talk about, you know, when your child has a tantrum in the grocery store, you know, let them know how real life works. When you act that way, you're not going to get any attention and you're not going to get what you want and just walk away. Well, step over step, them. Step over them on your way out. And, and there was a part of that that was like, as a dad, uh, that was like, okay, yeah. That's how I can be the dad and take charge and and demand respect and and expect responsibility and all those things. But then there was, as I prayed, like, Lord, help me to know the blind spots in my heart. Help me to acknowledge that while my kids are sinning, I have the capacity to sin too. And then and then Lord reveal that stuff to me. And 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 this would be even the fodder for Lynn and my conversations after is like, why did I act that way? Or why did you act that way? Or what was going on with you when that happened? And to be able to pray through and think through and be reflective about what was going on in me, that that question that we talk about so often now really was born back in these days where we recognize that if we took what was going on in us to prayer and ask God to reveal the 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 truth about how we might be thinking or what's going on in me or the untruth about it that things could change and sure enough they did because it started to reveal to me I was a dad that condescended that had judgments like in order to be okay I needed to feel in control of things and I was uncomfortable with chaos at certain times but not at other times like what's that <laughs> and mm -hmm. and you know to be mm -hmm. with, with the finger pointed inward I did my most important parenting work back then. And then that became the stuff we would talk about, pray about, wonder about. And then again, Lord, help me to be the dad I want to be. Lord, help me to be different this time. And even in the context of do-overs, I mean, I, I tell in, in other contexts the story of my first do-over, but prayer was right in the middle of my heart change. Like I went in, I acted a way I didn't want to act. I recognized that because of the fact that I'd been thinking and praying about this. You know, the Holy Spirit revealed to me, Jim, that's not it with a little help from our son who said, dad, you didn't connect first. <laughs> so I literally backed out where I'd come from and said a prayer, Lord, help me to be the dad mm. that you built me to be. And then I went back in and I brought grace and I brought kindness and I brought accountability, but with a, a lifted countenance and a light countenance, instead of a heavy domineering, I need you to behave in order for me to be okay, sort of a countenance. Boy, we started to see fruit in my work with other people's kids and then in our own relationships with our kids. Significant change as we grew in God's wisdom about what was happening here and how to bring mm -hmm. God's love into play when life got hard. You know, the fact that the two of you held yourselves accountable to scripture and the way God calls us to live as Christians, also to our kids to me, sets connected families apart too. And that is where that question came out of that you just said, Jim, what's going on inside of me? And then you were like, no, I'm going to change that. That's not okay to be condescending or to be too harsh or to be, you know, inconsistent as far as chaos. Okay, one day I don't get not okay another day, those kinds of things. That's hard work, though. And that has to get done before we get to love in the midst of misbehavior, because then we're understanding, you yeah. know, what's coming out of me. You know, if, if, if we slice it and dice it to like, what was the first step? I think the first step was to simply acknowledge, I don't like me. I don't like how I'm being as a dad sometimes. And then to ask the question, not how could I be better, but ask the question, what's that about? Sometimes, Jim, parents don't think I don't like me. They think this is how I'm supposed to be. 
I, you know, and it seems like a lot of times sure. parents get a pass because it's in the name of parenting. I need to be harsh and I need to be strong and I need to, you know. I suppose another thing that helped, and I know there's a whole bunch of talk about this too, but it was like, I began to notice distance in my relationships with my kids. Lynn by nature was softer, gentler, kinder parent than me. And I, and I started to realize that in as much as I wanted to be connected with the kids, even, even during good times, they would, they were gravitating, especially our oldest two, both, both our oldest kids were gravitating more toward Lynn because Lynn was the safe one and I was not. And it wasn't that I wasn't safe when I got home from work sometimes and was fun and playful and all those things. I mean, they liked that. That was great. But if if there was anything off or anything tense in the household, which was often the case with three wired kids and a wired dad, <laughs> and maybe even a little bit wired mom, you know, the kid, so I, I began to notice it's harder to have the kind of relationships with my kids that I want to have. Yeah. Not that I wanted them to be my friend or, you know, anything like that, but, but, you know, I just wanted, I wanted them to want me to come in and pray for them at night. I wanted them to want me to sure. read their stories at night. And there was less of that happening. And, and I started feeling sad. And then I, I mean, I can't remember exactly, sure. Lynn, but I'm guessing we had conversations about that. And, uh, you know, cause I do remember these conversations like, well, I wonder if maybe what happened earlier is why that is that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So, so we helped each other that way some, mm -hmm. but it was like, is the fruit that I'm hoping will grow out of my parenting efforts growing? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't as much as I'd like it to. So I had to go, you know, I had to I'd look at that. And then that compelled me to go, well, that's in part because I'm not being the dad I want to be. So those sorts of things happen little by little. We paid attention. We talked, we prayed, sought the scriptures more and more. And I can hear the Holy Spirit at work, teaching and training and even giving you courage to really think differently than mainstream Christian parenting teaching at the time. So I wonder mm -hmm. if there's more to say about how the gospel was infusing some of these new ideas. Well, the gospel was really central to it all because Jesus taking our punishment so that we can be reconciled to God. So Christian parenting things that really focused on punishment seem to miss the point. Well, they seem to they, they seem to go after proper behavior. Right. Yep. Just what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. That it was about behavior. It was about managing behavior. It was not about really reaching the heart of a child to bring true repentance and to bring reconciliation. Reconciliation with God and reconciliation with their sibling or their parent or whatever. And then that's when we kind of develop that hand illustration of clasping hands. God designed us to have close connected relationships with each other. And when we sin against each other, it breaks that connection. And so we don't just do an outward behavior or say sorry quickly, but we reconnect hearts. We reconcile because that's what God did for us when Jesus yeah. died on the cross. He reconciled our hearts to his. Yeah, we admit what we did was wrong and we go to the person asking forgiveness and we then make right what we've made wrong. You know, if I broke somebody's something, then I got to figure out how to fix that something as a part of the restoration. But it was a little model of the gospel in everyday life and behavior. And that hand clasp illustration, you know, when we misbehave or sin against each other, we break fellowship. We both walk away from each other and, and harbor things and whatever. And it's up to both of us to come back and to do the reconciliation and restoration. We taught our kids this. We also taught them that when we sin against God, we move. God doesn't. God's just right there waiting for us to come back and to confess our sin, repent from it. We don't want to do it anymore. We're going to walk away from what we did. And we're going to walk toward relationship again, you know, ask for God's forgiveness and walk in restored relationship with God as a once mm -hmm. and for all relationship. And so God never leaves, never forsakes, giving us a new identity. Yeah, we're going to struggle and we're going to do things that, you know, pull us from God from time to time, but it doesn't change what's real that he's forgiven us and our job to walk in fellowship with God is to keep returning time and time again into that relationship, that restored relationship that God made possible for us at the cross. So that was just a very pragmatic way we talked about it frequently and have taught others for a long time since. I really like that. And I love that you shared with your kids over and over again, time and time again, like you said, that Jesus doesn't go away. He that stays was for there. our benefit too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That for sure is. And I've talked about that a lot with my kids. I want to pick 
it up right there after the break, because I do feel like that thought, that piece of the gospel is just so central to our phrase that we're working on today, love in the midst of misbehavior. That's where Jesus doesn't walk away. He stays right there. So let's pick it up there in just a minute. Hey friends, Stacy here. One of the most challenging parts of parenting is that your kids will act out. The truth is they will misbehave. As parents, it's how we react in those moments that can shape their beliefs about themselves. Well, in our flagship online course called Discipline That Connects With Your Child's Heart, we teach a simple parenting framework that applies to every discipline situation, whether your child is two and throwing food or 12 and talking back. We have options for you, whether you prefer to learn in a group or as an individual. You could grab a couple of friends and start a small group. This could be a great way to introduce your friends to grace-filled parenting. Or click through to our show notes and find a group led by a Connected Families Certified Parent Coach. If you want to spend time processing and reflecting on the content alone, we've also got you covered. We have a special pricing just this month for you. If you register as an individual, you won't want to miss it. You can get all the information by tapping through to our show notes. Imagine the change in you, in your child, and in your family. I hope you get signed up today. Okay, we're coming in after the break, and we've covered lots of layers of the framework, but I promised <laughs> after, as we were going into the break, uh, we were talking about that Jesus is with us all of the time. He doesn't go away from us when we're misbehaving, and so that's where I promised we would start off now that we're after the break, because we need Jesus in these times, these struggles, the only way that we can show love in the midst of misbehavior is when we have received God's grace and truth so that we can pass it on. But Lynn, I, I love what you prepared for this podcast because it talks about the Trinity and it's just really practical because it's got Lynn Jackson's name on it. It's practical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the woman of the nitty gritty. Oh, we Details. love it. Yeah. This unfolded one day as I was preparing for a more in-depth Discipline That Connects workshop. And I just started thinking of all the different ways coaching clients had shown affection or had shown love to their kids in the midst of misbehavior. And I started writing all these examples down and grouping them and what made sense. And as I grouped them, I realized that there's a unique way in which each member of the Trinity does these things. And they sorted themselves out in just this beautiful demonstration of God's love. As you're saying, Stacey, the beautiful thing is that we have to receive each one of these things from God before yes. we can give it to our, our children. And so the mm -hmm. first one is just the affection of the mm. father. And you see the story of the prodigal son, and it's like, man, if he loved his just belligerent son and his snarky self-righteous son that way wherever i am on that spectrum of raging belligerent or or self-righteous and critical he loves me when i'm struggling with my child and so then we can love our kids and express our affection when our kids are struggling uh, just a story that we've we've shared in a written way but i don't think we've shared on a podcast uh, it was really core to our thinking in this time and we call it the report card story the report card story <laughs> our oldest came home with the not so shiny report card and this is back in the days when they came in the mailbox <laughs> and so all the report cards came the same day and the other two were quite nice quite good yep, pretty shiny. consistent shiny all across the board his was rather multicolored shall we say and you know there was an impulse in uh, it was my impulse to i be, wasn't gonna say I, but i get to tell that part so i was like all right we need to talk to him because he is certainly capable of more than this mm -hmm. and i was i was informed <laughs> by some of the thinking we've been doing about this and how do we edit it was 
wasn't as clear as the affection of the father just yet, but it was about, you know, how do we bring the love of Jesus into this kind of thing? And I'm like, we need to talk with him about the report card results for sure, because we know he can do better and we've watched his habits slide just a little. But before we do that, I just would like to suggest to the kids that we have a report card party just because God made them able to go to school and learn and grow in things. And let's have a party to celebrate them. And so we did. And we, we called them together and said, kids, we're going to have a party to celebrate the fact that we love you. Absolutely unrelated to the grades on the table right now. Yep. And so we got out the Nerf guns. We made popcorn. We ran around the house shooting at each other, hooting and hollering and having a great yeah. time. You can tell about the, the conversation next day. But the long term impact of that was this particular child, you know, at times in the future when he had really blown it just said to himself, there's a report card party for me for this. And that grace gave him mm -hmm. the strength to start over. Yeah. And that was the grace part of it. You know, we did want to keep him accountable. And so at the end of the party, I just sat him down and I said, Hey son, you know, we love you so much. And that was a really fun party. Wasn't it? Do you want to talk about the report card now or in the morning before you go to school? And he chose the morning. And so we talked about it in the morning before school. And we made some plans and some new rules about how study time was going to go and computer time was going to go. And he ended up doing far better the next semester. But you started that conversation with, which of these grades do you feel the best about? Oh, right. And that was just like, again, that brought grace to that difficult situation and dropped because he wanted to focus right away on all the things. Yeah, even after I asked the question, I still wanted to go to the, the not so shiny grades. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's go over here. Tell me what you did. Tell me what you enjoyed. Tell me about the class. Okay, what's there to learn from that? All right, next, next, next. Okay, how about here? And then what? by the time we got to the grades that weren't so great, you know, he was owning up. He was confessing. Not being told you didn't do or shouldn't do or could have done. He said, you know what? I could have and should have and I wish I would have. And oh, okay. And do you want some help being more accountable for that next quarter? Or do you think you can do that by yourself? Because if you if you can't, then we're going to have to put some things in place once once things start to go downhill. There's so many things about that story that are just potent and demonstrate the framework, but it really communicates you are loved no matter what. That's the message of this layer of the framework. It's not, it wasn't like some parents, right? Why are you rewarding this bad behavior? That is not what was happening. This was, we're doing a party because we are a family and we're celebrating our family and the kids and the semester and all the things. And we will still have the card conversation yeah. later that needs to be had where yeah. you will coach and you will hold responsible. It I love really that. opens the door for those other levels instead of getting stuck in an argument about the grade. Yeah. And if he'd have played us, like if he'd have received that as getting away with it and we, I got a party for this, we would have caught that. We would have known that. The Holy Spirit has given discernment. We're asking all the time, like, this is not a, a methodology. This is a, a work of insight and attentiveness and listening to God speak to us about things and not in a crazy mystical way, but just in a pragmatic way. What are we learning? How are we growing? And if he's trying to dupe us, we'll catch it. All right, Lynn. So we, so we covered the affection of the Father. And now the next one is Jesus. Tell the us about that. The empathy of Jesus. And mm -hmm. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And it all starts with empathy. Mm -hmm. And we won't go into great details here because we've talked so much about empathy on our podcast and people get that. But Stace, what would you have to say? About I think empathy was just the biggest game changer for me because when I've done that work of checking in with myself, what's going on in me, which means that I've then put my judgments aside or my own selfishness aside in the moment, I was able to go into hard moments with my kids and show love really through empathy, I would say that was sort of the first step into it. Because to me, it looked curious, like I wanted to know what was going on inside of my kids. And I asked that question out. And when I asked it, and it was 100% genuine, 
they received that as love, as mm -hmm. connection, as mm -hmm. kind of like the party earlier, right? This was the first step into what's really going on here before I move into taking care of, you know, what needed to be taken care of, having the hard conversation. And so empathy was really important for me in the way that I showed love to my kids in the midst of misbehavior. Again, you know, when we're struggling to just know Jesus has so much empathy mm -hmm. for me right now, he gets how hard this is. Yeah. And he can come alongside me and just encourage and strengthen and show his love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we also get some help as parents because we need it. We need it before yeah. the middle and after, Lynn. <laughs> yeah. And that's the help of the Holy Spirit. John yeah. 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate or helper to help you and be with you forever. Mm -hmm. And just the stories that we get of people stopping in the midst of mm -hmm. crazy situations and asking for that help from and wisdom from the Holy Spirit. It's just really so encouraging to hear these stories about parents just asking God for, for his help. I had one of those just recently. My girls are home from college and we had to do it. We had a big family uproar and it was not a nice one. Oh, Stacy, not in your family. No, oh, my yes. illusion is shattered. We happened to be all in the car and it was just, we were all up in our feelings and we'd all been a little bit ugly and a few things had happened in the days beforehand. And I just said, I don't know. I don't know what the way forward is right here. We need the Holy Spirit. And so we just stopped. We pulled over and we said, Holy Spirit, help us get our hearts right with each other. Wow. He did that. You guys, he helped yeah. us. Imagine that. And he's there. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah, we, that we, right in the middle we, of it. We ask and, and he provides. That's so underestimated and undervalued and under taught. I was talking with a dad who'd been through all kinds of parent teaching relative to his son, who was a very, very challenging child, a little neurodivergent issues, you know, and so the son struggled with surprises and then would have tantrums and didn't like the way things go if he didn't have ample warning and such a thing happened and he got mad and in the middle of the kitchen, he smashed a plate on the countertop, not intending to break it, I don't think, but it shattered into a thousand pieces. And the dad said, I, I, I felt my blood rush to my head and my ears, and I was going to be the parent and let him know in no uncertain terms, that is not okay. And you got to clean that up. Because it was all over the floor. It was all over the place. No, he, but he said, but I felt the Holy Spirit catch. And mm -hmm. I knew that that was not going to be a constructive way to help my son understand my love for him. And so yeah. I I just waited for a minute and I asked the Holy Spirit for some guidance and the Holy Spirit seemed to say to me, just go sit with him in the mess. So I went over and I sat down and I just sat on the counter there in the mess and he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? I just, I just want to be with you because of how hard I know this is for you. And then he sat there for a while. I don't remember exactly how the story ended, but or the details between now and the ending. The, the story ended with dad and son having a great conversation about what happened. They worked on cleaning it up together. The dad and he fully reconciled. The son apologized, repented of what he did, said he wanted to get better. It led them to some new plans for getting the son more of the kind of help that he'd been resistant to previously. And so there's another Holy Spirit moment mm -hmm. where the stopping the listening, the asking, the invitation to God's spirit to guide us can be so potent and powerful. And then, you know, we've known this family for some time now, and the trajectory mm -hmm. in the aftermath of that has just been astounding, really, if you don't attribute it to God, who can do, you know, <laughs> unfathomably more than right. we can ask or imagine. That mm -hmm. became a defining moment for that dad as he just sort of stepped into a deeper spiritual calling yeah. of bringing that unconditional love to his son who was so deeply discouraged mm -hmm. overwhelmed with life and his own behavior it's a beautiful picture of love in the midst of misbehavior that communicates you are loved 
in the good times and in the struggles and in the hard times. You are loved, my child. And again, it's the dad who received it. He had open ears to hear and he obeyed what the Holy Spirit told him to do. And it changed everything. Aren't we so grateful mm-hmm. for Jesus, for the Father yeah. and for the Holy Spirit? So and grateful. Jesus' love at the core has yeah. been changing humans ever since the cross. And so it sure makes sense, doesn't it, to invite that love into our daily struggles, our daily skirmishes, our daily challenges, our bad attitudes, our kids' bad behaviors, all of the things. Let's let's invite that love of Jesus to come alive even then. Wait and watch for the transformation that's almost sure to follow. Well, and we have a lot more information for any parent who wants more details about how to do this in daily life. I'm going to talk more about that in the outro. We also have a free PDF I'm going to talk about too. But before we get to the outro, would one of you pray for all of the parents listening today? Father, we just are so deeply, deeply grateful for the love that you shower down on us through your heart of compassion, through your son's empathy and the death on his death on the cross that brings us close to you and the Holy Spirit's guidance. And we just ask you to bless these families with clear experiences and manifestations of that love when they are struggling and needing it the most. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Jim and Lynn, for the deep dive conversation today. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Stacey. Thanks for tuning in today, friends. Hey, you guys, tap through to the show notes because we have a free PDF that you can get. It's 20 phrases that communicate empathy to our kids. Be sure to get that. And also tap through to our show notes to get more information about the discipline that connects with your child's heart online course. Now is a great time to pull together a friend or two or a bunch and go through the course. Hey, we learn better together, right? And honestly, we probably stick with it a little bit better when we're in with a group. So check that out today. All right, we are a listener-supported organization. Over 50,000 parents like you listen to the podcast every month. Individual donations make the work to equip and encourage families possible. For more information about Connected Families, follow us on Instagram or Facebook, LinkedIn, all the places, or go to connectedfamilies.org. I will see you next time. Bye.